Um, so thanks everyone, thank you for coming. Um, this is our final Posit Live event of the semester and we're calling it Turbo Topics, so it's a little bit more casual maybe than some of the other things we've done this semester and a little bit of a celebration of wrap wrapping up the semester. Um, before we start introductions, I just wanna announce that Posit recently updated their website with lots of new content, um, a lot of uh, video interviews, some of which we're playing at the beginning here. Um, with all of the lecturers that came this semester, as well as some more written stuff. So um, if you have a moment, go check out our site and see what, what we've been up to. Um, so tonight we're joined by three professors, um, Lori Brown, Sekou Cook, and Yutaka Sho. Um, and all three of these professors have been really supportive of POSIT with advice and participation um, since we've started, so we're really excited to have them here tonight. Um, Lori Brown is a professor at Syracuse Architecture. Um, her interests include the intersection of architecture and women's studies, and her expertise in this uh, topic has been pretty invaluable to us in helping POSIT develop um, our contemporary bibliography series that we've just started working on. Um, if you haven't submitted your photo to that, please do send it to thisisposit at gmail.com. Um, Seiku Cook is an assistant professor here. Um, he, uh, his current research has been focusing on hip hop architecture and exploring its definition in his professional electives as well as his published work. Um, and he has been a frequent and active attendee at all our Posit Live events this semester, so we're glad to have him. Um, and then Yutaka Sho is an associate professor. Um, whose work focuses on architecture as activism. So this packs October, as I'm sure many of you saw. Um, that day now, a series of public events and exhibitions with Hiroshima survivor and storyteller Keiko Ogura um, examined the current relevance of the 1945 atomic attacks on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Um, we are also joined today by three architecture students as well. So. Uh, Priscilla Amanderas is a fourth year grad student here at Syracuse Architecture, and she's also a class representative for POSIT. Um, so she's been working on the Shelfie thesis ex exhibition um, in collaboration with Syracuse Architecture and POSIT. Um, Emma Stoll is a fifth year undergrad, and she has a minor in women and gender studies. Um, so she too is a class rep for POSIT and is published on our site, so make sure to check out her article under Studio Culture. And then finally, Oswald Perez is a second year undergrad and he's a team member of POSIT and has been working with us on the Contemporary Bibliography Project. Um, my name is Sarah Ritchie, I'm the Editor-in-Chief and I'm gonna be moderating today. Um, so the way this will work is we're gonna choose uh, a topic out of this ceramic bowl that Thomas Quay has sculpted for this event. <laughs> um, so the topics are a combination of terms thought up by the POSIT team as well as ones that were submitted on our social media accounts. Um, and each professor using that sign has an opportunity to extend the five minute time frame. If, yeah, the students, you, you can do it too, I guess. We're kind of winging it. <laughs> um, so there's a five minute timer that Dina is, is running, in theory. Um, and we'll see how many we get through by 6.30. Does anyone have any questions before we start? I don't think there's enough time for questions. Probably not. We might only get through, get through one, we'll see. Um, does someone want to choose the first, or should I choose it? I don't know. Okay. You, you go, you go. I'll just hold it. We'll, we'll share. Okay. <laughs> and the topic is advocacy. <laughs> All right, I guess I'll, I'll start. I don't really have anything to say, but I'll, I don't like dead air. Um, uh, advocacy in architecture. I guess um, when I think about advocacy in architecture, I think about agency, first of all. Like what is, and it's a question that I ask myself quite a lot. Um, what is the agency of the architect in um, shaping and molding environments? Where do we have say? How much power do we have in actually creating the things that we spend so much time designing and, and thinking through? Um, and uh, if we figure that part out, then we can get to the larger question about how can we actually advocate for causes through the things that we design? So I think we kind of get lost quite often in um, how do we produce something? How, does, how do we make sure that the things that we want to produce actually get done? And when you transition out of academia into practice, 
you actually find out that the architect has a whole lot less agency, um, less implicit agency um, in, in the field, and a lot of the agency that we do have, we have to fight for. Um, and once you do kind of create that space, um, stake that ground, then I think we have more say or more um, possibility to, to create advocacy in one way or another. Can everyone hear me? So um, I guess the first things that I think about is who are we advocating um, with, I'll say, instead of for or as. So who are we, uh, how are we holding ourselves as architects accountable? Um, what types of issues are we advocating for? How are we addressing our own um, privileges, perhaps? And then how, what types of communities we're advocating? with, who we're, who we're working with. When we say contextual, like what type of contextual work are we doing? Um, and how does that apply to people, not just built environments? How are we looking at those communities? Going off of that, can you hear me? Um, advocacy is a tough word for me because I work in Rwanda and because I'm not black, I'm treated as white. And what I say carries further. Um, my clients say something something they do and things start to happen um, if that's the case then I'm representing and just like any other politicians who represent and start taking power there is a difference between representation and um, uh, proxy and sometimes I rather be a proxy and not represent but because of the power I have I feel like I have to represent to take uh, leverage of that power for the, in the name of my clients. So it's, it's a really tricky issue um, in the context of colonialism. So in my seminar, we've been reading some feminist political geographers. And one of the things we just read this past week was looking at alternative ways towards capitalism. So this is kind of where my head has been for a little bit. And I have a thesis student looking at issues of economics. So. I think when, I, when advocacy comes up, I think we have to advocate for things other than capital and other than the 1%. And the way our discipline is structured very often, those are precisely the camps that we, we have to engage with or are told or expected to engage with for us to practice. And one of the things these feminist geographers have been talking about are alternative ways to think about labor and to think about what labor is not identified under capitalism that still has a lot of power. So in their case, they're thinking of cooperatives, they're thinking of exchanges, they're a kind of radical ideas to think about ch exchanges between London and Ghana, for example, because so many Ghanaian doctors have come to, to, the, to the UK for jobs. So could there be reciprocity where the UK sends back money for these doctors to Ghana, so that the, and then the doctors can stay in Ghana. But thinking really out of the box about how we think of, how advocacy starts to be used in ways that questions capital and, ca and questions the architect's role in capital exchange. And so who do we practice for? I think it's very much a part of this context, how we practice, and what are some alternative ways to practice? So it may be advocacy, but it, there may be other ways to, to rethink or reconfigure what we do and the roles we take within contemporary culture. Okay. This one is the wall. <laughs> Should I pull a different one? You want to do it? Do I want it? I... <laughs> so, well, when, when I hear the wall now, I'm thinking about a very different wall. <laughs> I'm thinking about the wall that, that me and that my students are working on right now with, uh, on the south side. So uh, maybe we can, I'll skip this one. Right? So I didn't understand, I, I mean, I didn't think of, I'm not sure what you meant by the wall, but then all Mexico? of a sudden I thought about the south US border. Yeah. Is that, I mean, so that's in what I just thought was what you mean by the wall came up uh, when we hoped Randall Corman would maybe attend this, <laughs> and uh, then he couldn't because he was on sabbatical. But <laughs> the, the wall, like the wall to Mexico would be a great one if you want to talk about that. So that's what I was thinking of. And some of the things I've been thinking about the wall, I have a research project that started looking at women who cross in order to give birth who are undocumented and often illegal. 
And so what this, so when Trump called for design ideas for the wall, I, I immediately thought we have to think of other ways to think about this border that's really not a border. It's quite porous and in fact, what is Texas was Mexico. So where and how borders are understood in the south of Texas is quite different, and, and New Mexico and Arizona and California, th that wall is a complete fabrication and a, and a political boundary, but that reinforces an ideology. So I, I mean, I think it's actually completely ludicrous and we have to uh, that, deconstruct any way we can what that wall represents. But that wall is not going to work, right? Because what's most important about the U.S.-Mexico border is that the couple miles that is there so that they can shoot each other. If there's only a wall and if you can cross it and be an immigrant at that point, then um, it's easier. Then <laughs> you need that, that space so that you can shoot. So it's, it doesn't even work, but you know, it's, it's symbolic. Um, and that's probably more important to certain people. Have you guys read The City and the City by China Meville? And that's, that's a diff completely different way of having two countries in the same place where you, know, you, you, you are two countries, but then, so you might belong to country A and I might belong to country B, but there's a property line and that's country A and that's country B, and I can't even look at you. Like, if you look at you, the police would arrest me. So I have to ignore the presence of country A, and that makes the, the street walking completely fictional, but that really resonates um, with being an immigrant and not supposed to be person who doesn't belong here, but you have to pretend that you belong there and you can't look at the immigrants because they're not supposed to be there and like all that was really well um, drawn out in that novel. Um, so that's more important than a wall. Wall, wall doesn't work. I, I, I think it's fascinating that if, if you ask architects, uh, a panel of architects, um, or gave them the proposition, the wall, like two years ago or five years ago, no one would even think about the, the wall in, 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 um, between the Mexico and US border. Um, and we would start to talk really ephemerally about like the characteristics of a wall and, and what a wall does and what it can do metaphorically, conceptually. Um, and uh, in, in a way, like the, the political realities of the wall um, have kind of questioned I've kind of, yeah, the, going through a wall. Um, I've, it's kind of forced us to question um, what we talk about when we talk about architectural elements, that we're not just talking about these physical, conceptual constructs, these things that we draw and build, but the, the politics and the economics and the social dynamics that all of these things are attached to. So um, if we're trying to find silver linings within this entire conversation, we have to think about, you know, the fact that this has actually forced us within architecture to start to think about ideas that actually matter and think about ideas about design that are about people, that are people-centered and not just idea or formally centered. Yeah, I mean, I don't necessarily agree that that wouldn't have been um, an important topic to talk about, and it certainly would have been relatable to people who have to experience those issues. So what it, I think that's more of a point of like, or more of a commentary on what this institution, architecture, how we learn about it and how we practice it is ignoring or excluding certain stories and experiences and bodies and types of representation that are in this field. Okay. <laughs> um, so, uh, my parents are immigrants, so like, I wouldn't be sitting here if such thing was like put into place. So like, like I uh, kind of agree with all the points that were brought up. Where it's like, I think design does have to do with people and their stories and their narratives. So like, and it comes down to like the people we interact with every day. I would even add that if you're thinking, or I would want to think of 
the architectural problem of the wall and designing the wall is something that becomes a political issue and how we have the power to kind of reverse what Trump was asking for, if a wall, and then we kind of implement this porous activity that happens within that where you're reversing what he wants and actually putting and politicizing what actually happens between that border and actually blurring the lines of that political border, that physical border. Um, so I think that that is a way that we can think of it as a silver lining to where we have a power to change something that, you know, is potentially really bad. Liz. <laughs> Le Corbusier. The what? <laughs> oh, that's not on my list. <laughs> <laughs> that was actually submitted to us via social media ah, by okay. someone who sent Fair it to enough. us. Fair enough. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> can we just not talk about him? <laughs> I mean, can, can we have, uh, yeah, <laughs> a five minutes of silence? <laughs> I, I think it would be really powerful. I think it would be really powerful to have an architecture conversation in an architecture school that doesn't mention. <laughs> but some that's old not what's Swiss happening in the classrooms. That calls himself or the, the crow. history classes, particularly. So, what do you have to say about it? Yeah, come on. <laughs> I guess I have a lot to say, but it, I'm just, my point about that is yes, we could resist it right now, but it's still being taught. It's still being preached about in our classrooms. And he was a racist, fascist, patriarchal person, misogynist. A misogynist. I mean, the list keeps going. So why are we only looking at these Western colonial models of, of figures? Why are we like, why do we see him as one of the greats? I think we should all be asking that. Um, so <laughs> that makes me think about, um, in a very odd kind of upside down way, it makes me think about, um, the current like Harvey Weinstein, Louis C.K., and now Matt Lauer is on this list, you know. Um, Rose, Bill O'Reilly, Bill O'Reilly Charlie Rose, we can name them, we can go and, and do a full name shaming. Um, but it makes me think about um, how, do, how you separate people's actions, like the things that they've done in the world versus the things that they've done that are reprehensible. And um, is that something that we should add to this conversation or not? There, why aren't, um, why isn't that there a list for architects? There should they be a exist. very long list of architects. Because However, we don't, we, we, don't ma we don't matter enough for us to make the front page of the New York Times. I think it's worth acknowledging, yes, I'm not saying that this is my point of view, but I think that it's worth acknowledging the kind of opposite in any situation for any person. It's just that, that yes, we all have these kind of gory backgrounds, maybe not we, but um, a lot of people have these gory backgrounds, but we also have all of these great creative um, agencies within us, and I think it's still important to teach Corbu in the school just because it has a certain kind of value to the core as a school, um, the core at, to architecture just as a whole, but I think in the way that we think of, um, the way that the media is presenting people in the century, it's become a little bit more complex and it forces us to think of those things and then we have to take a stance if we're gonna completely ignore those people because of their personal lives or if we're gonna take it completely into consideration and then ignore that creativity and that power that they have into um, providing that uh, sort of success to the profession. There was Canon on the list, mm -hmm. right? So it's similar to the conversation about that. Um, and what Canon gives us is the currency to exchange ideas with. So because you have that, then you can think about and talk about and go against other ideas or the currency itself. And the problem with currency, just like the knowledge or canon is that when you just start accumulating it just for the sake of accumulating, then it's, it creates separations, isolations, and haves and have nots. So as long as we're using it to continue exchange, I think you're right that we, I think we should know it. Um, but there are other currencies like Bitcoins and stuff like that now. So yeah, like if we can use it, to our 
advantage, I think it's fine. Yeah, it's kind of like looking um, at Hitler, the architecture for Hitler. There's something really beautiful about it, but it's also kind of um, a little bit scary to think of that as beautiful because of the person that was commissioning that architecture. But you don't necessarily have to dismiss it completely. I think that there's a certain point where we acknowledge the opposite, even if we don't um, accept it or, yeah. But I think, so canons I think are valuable but the context in which canons operate need to be expanded and discussed. So learning about these particular master figures within or without the context of, his, of a larger historical, socio-economic, political context is quite problematic. And I think the fact that most of the canon that we know of in our discipline at this point is still a white male canon. So until that canon becomes diverse, it's a problem, at least for me. I think it has to become more diverse in order for it to be useful to engage a much broader spectrum of not only the population, but of the students that we hope to recruit and keep in, and ex so we expand the discipline. So I think the canon as it stands is incredibly problematic. If you look at the rest of humanities, they for decades have been expanding and diversifying who they're reading and who they're looking at. But for some reason, our discipline has been incredibly recalcitrant and in not wanting to change it. So that's a huge issue about who you're learning about and who you seek as models for, for theory, history, for design, um, period. So I'll, I'll extend a couple more minutes um, because I, I think, yeah, we're, <laughs> um, we are, uh, you know, as, as, a, as a discipline, as a profession, we are decades behind in many, many areas, um, diversity being the number one uh, area there. And um, so, but I want to come back to uh, how that relates to separating people from their work. I think in, in, in architecture, especially since our list of canons are so thin and so myopic in, in, in where they're coming from, um, we kind of have to study these to start the conversation to go somewhere else. But I think it would be really powerful and positive to imagine um, talking about Le Corbusier, talking about Frank Lloyd Wright, talking about um, Rem Koolhaas, and talking about their personal lives as well, talking about how their personal views have helped shape different parts of our environments, have helped or their, either their specific personal views or their ignorance of certain things or their um, reluctance to, to think about or talk about um, what's happening on the ground or who these people are, who they're affecting with their work in different ways. If we can actually um, add that into the conversation somewhere else in the curriculum or at the same time as marriage with, the, uh, you know, marrying both things together, teaching them both at the same time, then that actually opens up a much larger discussion about what we do yeah, in architecture. Yeah, but I don't think, I'm, I'm of the belief that you can't separate, you can't bracket out that a person's lived experiences are paramount in constructing their identity and the type of work they do. Like, does it matter when you learn about E1027 that it was graffitied by, by Corb? How does that change your reading of him? How does it change your reading of her? How does it change your reading when the Pierre Chereau House was a doctor who performed abortions in the 1930s in, in Paris? How does that change your understanding? I think it's important, it enriches it, it broadens it. So I don't think you can bracket out. Like, the, the, the good and the bad are all a part of the same package. Okay, thank you. Next one. All nighter. <laughs> I'll let Oswald take this one. <laughs> I've pulled. <laughs> I lost count, but like, it's fine, but. Um, no, it's not. Um, I try my hardest to sleep a minimum of four hours every night. I honestly put so much effort into that. You know, I'm trying to get, Seiku says you have to sleep eight hours every night. I'm not on that level yet, but. <laughs> 
the goal is eventually I'll get there. You know, it's like a process. Like, I think coming into like um, architecture school, like the idea of studio and like, like so much is demanded. It's just like every day is like, let's try to do better this time. And like, it's constantly like trying to get like a better hang of like working in this way of like studio and architecture and like, Maybe I won't get there, but crossing my fingers, I do. So you have, I learned from you to sign a contract, not to pull all-nighters. Yes. And I, you signed it. Although I should ask the students who are here if they've actually, I mean, they've, well, there is a caveat. So they do sign a contract. It's negotiated. I should ask them, people who've been in my studio before, does it work? I think it, does it work? You still pull all-nighters. No, it doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so I will say, if I can help you modify your behavior, it's a success. Ideally, there would be no all-nighters at all. Because there's a myth. There's some stupid-ass myth that pulling all-nighters is going to make you have a much better project. But if you worked consistently over the course of the duration, that project would be so much better than pulling all-nighters. And it's to get that through your head is just like so difficult. And I think part of it is you get inculcated as a first year undergrad that somehow pulling all-nighters is a necessity to do your work. And I don't think that's true. But that's also coming from the practice, right? Like the, yes. the yeah. firms I think it's kind of, yeah. yeah I, I, I don't blame the students at all. I blame the institution. Well, the institution of architecture has for like 150 years entrenched in people's brains that this is the way that architecture works. But to change the discipline, you yeah. change people who are in it. So I think you have to, I mean, I try, that it's the goal is to really try and work with you to change your behavior so you're more efficient. I think it's about efficiency and workflow. So, I mean, I like I came into the school knowing that I wasn't going to sleep. Why why did I know that? You know, cuz it was already it's kind of like this like fetishized thing of like it's like a, a badge of honor that you don't sleep all night, that you're exhausted, that you're dehydrated, like all these simple things that we know that um have that how we're supposed to take care of like our bodies but that our emotional health is not talked about at all and that's something that I always include in my critique of like studio culture because um, that that's not considered at all and often I feel seen as a point of laziness more so than the physical if, if a student I have never heard of a student taking a day off because they didn't feel well emotionally or because they were depressed or they were dealing with something because it's not seen as a legitimate reason because you can't show it you can't show that you're depressed in the way that you have a cold or whatever. So there's that. It's very much bred in to the culture. And there's so many overlaps and so many contradictions because um, many professors who don't put as much effort on into it as you do, but even so, like, they, we, we're hurt, we hear it in, um, as soon as we're admitted that there are these stereotypes and don't follow them, you know, still get sleep and still do all these things, but then the amount of work we get does not match that. And there, this major, this profession does require amount of work, but what, how can we all change that? And how can we as students protest that more when, and take it really seriously instead of, um, instead of making it a thing of, of competition versus kinship, so. I, I, I'd like to say that I actually talk about emotional health quite a lot in my, in my studio, and I think hopefully Oswald can back that up, and I see some of my students here um, are, are saying, no, I don't talk about that emotional health. That didn't happen my I year. talk about, <laughs> you, it probably is passed over your head, but I talk, talked a lot about emotional health, about, um, you know, I never start a class session before looking at everybody in their eye making sure everybody's here and present and smiling, <laughs> right? That's, that's the first thing I do. P students don't notice it. They don't understand what I'm doing. You but notice it's, it. It's, but <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's a calculated thing. It's very, very intentional. It's like, I want to make sure that I'm connecting with everybody in this space before we start, that everybody's there before we start, 
and that we are all on the same page. And if I notice somebody's not smiling or they're not in their right space, I want to understand what that's about. And from the, from the faculty side, I'm sure all of us faculty have gotten many students in our offices over the years that have had different problems that we've done whatever we could to, to support them. Um, or if we're not capable or equipped to support them in that way, we're, we're sending them to the right places to find that support that they need. Yeah. So this is something that is probably not reinforced universally in the culture of the school, but it's something that's very important to me and I make sure that I, I reinforce it with my students. And, and back to the all-nighters point, that's part of the overall like life support that, that you have to have, you have to be a complete person. You find space to fit your work in between eating, sleeping, showering, taking care of your health, taking care of your relationships, making sure you do all that stuff and getting <laughs> and, and calling your, your, your family. That's something that I'm, I'm lacking on, of course. Um, but you know, you're, you're, you're doing it. And, and I think the work doesn't get any easier. I say this to my students all the time. The work of architecture doesn't get easier. It doesn't get easier first year to second year to third year. It doesn't get easier after you graduate. What gets easier is your ability to cope with all the things that, are, that you're dealing with. So what we're teaching you is strategies of coping with all of the different demands that this profession has. And in a weird, twisted way, that's, that's turned into not sleeping. But you don't have to not sleep to cope with those demands. Has anyone ever brought up an issue of emotional health, health with their professor? And how'd it go? <laughs> I just think maybe if, I'm sure things have, have changed and that there, it is better, but there's still not enough transparency. And I think it's seen like, particularly with emotional health as like an unprofessional thing to talk about if you say you're not feeling well. I think it's also based on our sort of how we deal with healthcare in our country. Yeah. I mean, it comes back to this. In Holland, you can get six month paid leave without a doctor's note, but saying, I'm mentally stressed, I need a break, I want to relax. And the student goes and tells your student, the professor, or the coordinator, that's it. There's no discussion. So I think, yes, it's true within architecture school, but I think it's a larger sort of, it's indicative of how we treat, I mean, come on, are mentally ill, we throw on the street. This is disgusting. So I think we can, just like what Lori was saying earlier, these are systematic issues that we can't address sort of, you know, in isolation. So I think there are good examples of architecture schools throughout the world that do this. Mm -hmm. And it's not necessarily a thing about architecture, but our country. But it is something about... I do agree that the culture might be changing now. It's not, it's not systematic enough. Um, it puts too much onus on the individuals. Either it's the student or the faculty. Um, 
and not sleeping is not even like the biggest problem, right? Like the having the curriculum this tight and have to finish it in five years and you have to have all these loans after you graduate and you like have to pay back for 30 years. It's, and we don't get paid that much when you graduate. It's like, it's ridiculous. So yeah, I'm, I'm looking for actual things to do. You know, what are the concrete steps that we can actually take? And there was the um, uh, Peggy Deemer and what was the architectural lobby? They were trying to get unionized, I think, um, try to demand a pay raise, but we would never do it because we're such, we're so proud to be individuals or something. So there's the kinship, new way of creating the kinship um, needs to be created, but that's way too you know, broad and abstract. So it would be great to start um, coming up with concrete steps that we can take. I think since this has kind of become a free-for-all anyway, I'm going to say something. <laughs> um, I think also it, you know, it comes down to a student-to-student -student thing too. Um, professors aren't here at 3 o'clock in the morning to monitor to make sure their students go home. And I think it's really important. Um, students have a really strong sort of support system for each other, but I think that includes being responsible for one another and telling your friend who's sitting in the lab at 4 a.m. who hasn't slept in five days that they just need to go home because nothing productive happens between the hours of 3 and 8 a.m. in this school at all whatsoever. So I think it's, it also comes down to our student responsibility to one another to make sure that we're being healthy and supporting each other to have sort of productive lifestyles. I think I'm going to answer Yutaka's question and it's kind of going off of what Matesh said, is that if the students are saying that it's not happening, it's not happening. I think the first step in what I see is that professors, it has to be not just student-student, but professor to professor in acknowledging teaching styles with each other, the curriculum, and how much work you're giving, how much work someone else is giving, and not just prioritizing studio as like the most time-consuming or history with Professor Bedard, the most time-consuming, you know, it has to do with acknowledging that this curriculum is demanding and then talking to each other about how you can help the students. I mean, I, I, would, I will say in third year, and, we, and this is happening or trying to happen across the years, that we're really trying to coordinate, and we were unsuccessful this year, I will definitely claim that, with all your other deadlines. So how can we manage on the faculty curriculum side ways that you don't get slammed day after day after day in non-studio deadline week, which I'm embarrassed to say happened for the third years this year, so there are, and we need to do better at that. So it's understanding more holistically how and when you have deadlines, what is that workload, and that is definitely on the faculty, for sure. I'll definitely add that it also, uh, a key component of that is talking about it before it happens, because I have, like I, t I TA for studio, and I have my students, and I always defend them. If they have like a rep uh, assignment that's due, and they have studio, I talk to my professor, and I'm like, hey, can we like minimize the workload for Thursday? And he's like, okay, I'll think about it. Um, it has to happen before the student feels stressed so that that doesn't happen, and then that kind of, that maybe helps with avoiding even thinking about, I have to pull it on lighter. Great, okay. <laughs> the next one I pulled was sustainability. It's the same thing. We can, we can skip, we can pull something else. All in favor. <laughs> Seriously? Not, not that we don't care. We can't, we can't ignore sustainability. Not that we don't, okay, good. Come on. I mean, we may not want to call it sustainability, but uh, have we looked at what's happening and climate change and what is our role as architects? We're one of the most, the, the construction industry is one of the largest contributors to climate change. So, you know, we so, can't just say yeah, no. It's, it's not something that we can just push away. I think that the, the, the problem comes when these words become like buzzwords that start to mean like a whole like uh, faction of an industry that's just trying to sure, increase Sure, the whole greenwashing thing, I get it. But, you know, line. systemically within our curriculum and within our discipline, we need to be teaching you, we need to be engaging with issues of climate change and sustainability from day one. To, do, to not do that is unethical and killing the planet. No more blue foam. 
<laughs> yeah. Half agree. of this school is filled with blue oh foam. God. That does not biodegrade. That's just one single. But even the sustainability courses that we teach here, though, they're, they're geared toward a very particular class. Like it's really expensive yeah. and makes, like, takes a lot to sustain it, to be sustainable. And sometimes it doesn't work. Um, and that sends a message to other countries. And they try to do it but they don't have the capacity to maintain it, so it just sits there. Um, but the Western companies get to sell all those tools and you know, equipment to the other countries, and you know, it just perpetuates the economic non-sustainability and political um, hierarchy. So our sustainability teaching needs to diversify quite a bit, um, and what I'm most interested in is the economic diversity. You have to make it affordable. I, I've always thought that sustainability should be kind of second nature in, in, in architecture design studios, that it shouldn't be something that's an add-on, it should be something that's uh, an assumed, just like structure, just like um, form and space, just like uh, program, sustain sustainability strategies is, is a default position and it, it for me it, it I err to the side of uh, common sense approaches rather than high high tech approaches because f from my point of view all the research and engineering and design and production and energy that goes into producing green materials and sustainable things is is really kind of um, antithetical to what it's trying to do it takes a whole lot of work and energy to produce um, a really high performing facade that you could have used something that is a lot, um, that, that hasn't taken so much work and time to produce that would re produce a different effect. And I think when we talk about sustainability, we're usually, it's, uh, a lot of times we're, we're looking at um, one number or one factor, um, how much energy does it save, how much, um, uh, how much uh, heat gain or heat loss does it, does it maintain. Um, but we, we don't fully think about all of the embodied energies of all of these systems. Like where does this material come from? How far does it have to travel? How much energy does it take to get it out of the earth? How much, how many, how much labor is it taking? how much time and energy um, and man hours is it taking or, or human labor hours is it taking to produce these, these, these things? Um, and then what are the life cycle costs of, of, of these materials that we're using? So um, I'm not sure if we're not if, talking about it like, holistically, then it I'm becomes I'm not sure if reductive. that's the problem though. Like more information is not what we need. We have enough information and it's pretty obvious that you know, the earth is dying if we don't do something. I think I'm so just talking about information more, I'm talking more about attitude. Like what is our general attitude as an industry towards sustainability? Is it about maintaining or getting higher tech materials? Or is the attitude about just being really smart about the, the, the resources that we have and using them in the most efficient way? But how do we communicate it is the problem because scientific data is clear. Right, so it's not the science, it's not the knowledge or the holistic understanding that's lacking, it's there. But it's the, I don't know what it is, like ideological blockage that- Political will. Sure, but so if that's the case, then like how do we push it? Um, so there was, there's a series of sci-fi that's coming out that targets the um, climate change and all of them sounds like, more recent ones, are very pessimistic, right? They don't have a very good view of the future. Um, and one of them was saying, being interviewed, was saying that maybe climate change is just way too big for us to understand. It's so, like ge geological time, it's just impossible for our little brain to fathom. So then how do we even communicate? So it feels like the problem is, much bigger than yeah, yeah. what we can 
understand. I'll say something a little bit silly on that, um, and it's going back to like how do you acknowledge it, and it's all around us, and going back to Lori's comment on climate change, it's have you guys noticed that it's not snowing four feet an hour outside right now? I get like Google Photos um, kind of like this day a year ago, and this morning it was Otto kind of like sledding down the little castle on Krauss College, and it's like it's actually kind of warm outside. We're not wearing these heavy coats. And I think it starts with acknowledging the world around us and that that's really where the problem stems from. And that's why we need to talk about sustainability. I know we didn't want to talk about it, but that's one way of thinking about it. And not just that like it's not snowing right now, the extremes, that it's 30 degrees and then it's like 70 degrees each day. That it, it's, it's more than just like the season's changing and now it's warmer. It's, it's not just getting warmer, it's like extremes of weather. And this is different in every different place. But, to get to like the very kind of micro level of how we practice each day in this building, like what if we were limited in the amount of materials we were supposed to use, like professors hypothetically, particularly during freshman year when you first come here and start to learn these practices, you have like a set number of materials and you have to make models using those materials. Instead of saying I want 150 blue foam models <laughs> and then it's fucking everywhere in this building <laughs> and the fumes are awful and all, like it's just, this is like a very specific issue, but you know, I'm just thinking so that we can think about how we practice every day right now in this building and questioning those methods. Great, okay. I think we have time for one more. I'll try and pick a good one. That's okay. <laughs> Starkitect. <laughs> <laughs> the first thing that comes to mind is, okay, in addition to the canon, it's the white, last white male bastion of our discipline is the star architect. And they don't want to die, and they're not going to let go, <laughs> and we have to fight like hell to change it. And I think if everyone who's a part of the production of architecture gets, gets, is contributed and is acknowledged, it starts to shift the conversation because it is ridiculous that every star architect except for Zaha Hadid is, is a white man, pretty much. A man, often white. So I hate that, loathe it. Um, so I got something to say about Stark. Um, I, I think to me, the, the most um, ri ridiculous part of it, or the most ironically ridiculous part of it, is that architecture has no real stars. <laughs> like, n not real stars, right? There are, there are stars to us, but we're in our little bubble here, and we're so high on our own fumes that, that <laughs> we think, that, we, we think that, that this is the entire world, and it's not. Um, just talk to anyone. I mean, too bad it's after Thanksgiving, but if, if, like, go to your family, go to your friends who are not architects, if you have any friends who are not architects. Ask them to name one architect, and if they can, ask them to name two, <laughs> right? The, the architects don't really become stars, and, and, um, and that might seem kind of silly, but to me, I think that is, that is um, it's indicative of the fact that our society does not value what we do. And that's a problem for architecture, that we need to be more valued in what we do. Our impact in the world needs to be much more, much more understood and felt. That doesn't mean stardom, per se. I think, obviously, celebrity is not something that we're all striving for. But we should have um, the, the same way that we can recognize um, important people in fields of politics or sports or fields of, of fine arts or music, we should be recognizing people who actually have sometimes more important impacts in the world. Um, and I think that's a PR issue for architecture. I agree, but then the problem is when you do ask them and they know someone, it's Bjarki. Yeah. And 
then he becomes a representation. I don't know for anyone outside field. of architecture who knows the name Bjarki or even knows that Bjarki is a name. If they can name an architect that can name Frank Lloyd Wright, maybe maybe Frank Gehry. Okay, but they all still look like the same person. Yes. <laughs> so, Absolutely. and that that's a problem in the field. Yes. So then when it becomes a representation outside of it, and that's all that they know about it, then that's how it's represented, and it's just an amplified issue, so. So there's an issue about relatability, right? Like these architects that our parents can name, they're easier to understand. Um, uh, they're relatable, they're populists. On the other hand, there are things that are more difficult to explain um, that we consider and we are valuable for that is not possible to, to use it as a marketing tool. So, but at the same time, politics is very difficult to relate to, but they have power. So I'm, I'm not sure if it's the issue of communication, I'm not sure if it's the issue of populism, um, I don't know exactly what it is, but it's, it's certainly the way we create our environment um, and try to hold on to the knowledge that we have and, and not necessarily share it or make it um, get the feedback from the outside perhaps. Um, we, we might want to give, but we don't tend to want to take. So that is also a problem, I think. I, I, I really think it's a, a, a marketing issue. It's a PR issue, um, not only a PR and marketing issue, but um, I think those aspects of it are very important to me um, because every, every client that I've ever had, I've had to explain what it is that yeah, but I do. Two to three, and, I think and it's we complain all the time about the fact that we don't get. Of the world's paid. construction uses an architect. Three to five percent. That's so that, part of the, that's, that's, that's not that's, communication, that's actually use. Like, who are we? building and working for? Who but are our clients? I, I think that's a symptom of the problem. It's not communication, it's our actual investment in working with a broad spectrum of, of our environment. I, I think architects now, we're of a generation where we're realizing that we have more power to create our clients and create who we're working for, but historically the profession is a service profession, so we sit the back and wait for the phone to ring, wait for somebody to call us to, to do projects for us, projects for them, and that is the top one or two percent of the population that can afford to pay those service, for those services. And when they pay for those services, they underpay for the services because they undervalue what those services are for. So if we did a better job of, of publicly educating everyone about what architects are, who architects are, what we do, and what the value is in society, then eventually we would actually have a broader range of people who are, who are um, understanding what our services are, respecting those services, and paying for it. Nobody, go, nobody who, has, who has contracted a lawyer really questions why lawyers charge so much, or really questions why doctors charge as much as they charge. They see it as an essential thing that they have to have and they pay it immediately. I, but I think we're, we're culpable. We, we don't work with a broad spectrum of the public. It's, it's our own fault. We have given it away. And until we reclaim it, it's just gonna, we're not gonna be recognized. It's our own, it's in part our own fault. Do one more, we'll do one more. Sorry, <laughs> faked you out. <laughs> well, this gets out, I, no, I don't think so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this goes back to your point, interdisciplinary. What about the students? What about, Let's hear from you guys. So like, I think inherently the architect is <laughs> interdisciplinary. So like, so like the architect is inherently like, has to be like an interdisciplinary person. Like, I think 
the idea like of architecture like you have like it, they're not disconnected like I don't feel that there's should be like this idea of like even talking about being like interdisciplinary like it should be innate like it should be built into the package of what an architect is should be but it's not <laughs> right and For I don't yeah. get that particularly I feel at least in this I mean I'm talking from an experience of being in this school so keep that in mind but um, you know social justice issues I want to talk more about gender and race and class and all these things and those become one day lectures that are like tokenized within like other classes that I'm taking like we can cover gender and race in one lecture for a whole semester like this, these conversations these um, the interdiscipline, like it's more intersectional, right? Having intersectional conversations about these things should be a daily basis. We should be thinking about these things when we're designing. So they should be embedded in the practice. It's more interesting to think about why we don't though, yeah. instead of like bitching about it. Why do you think it is? What, what's, what do you think we would lose if we become more interdisciplinary? Where, where do you think the resistance comes from? Is some people must think that we lose something, right, if we do it. That's why there's a resistance. Well, I mean, as we've been saying, it's a systemic issue. If you have people at the top who, are, who all look the same, who are white, rich men, the, that list goes on, right? And then the fields are dominated by them. The practices that we learn are through those methods and ideas. And so it's, it's all trickling down until we see ourselves as so far away from those, those types of issues, perhaps, or we see um, the fact that we don't have those conversations is, um, is just so normalized. So it's, it's a much larger issue, and it's, it won't just change by us working with in these systems, we really have to like question the systems themselves, and, and yeah, like why we're not having these conversations. That's too broad. So if the yeah, <laughs> okay. like in an attempt to try to answer your question, I think it might come down to an issue of futility. Like we don't believe we're really capable, or like that it's not um, important enough for us to like try and make that distinction because. I think just going back to like glossing over everything that we've touched up on in this discussion, um, like for instance, I think like one of the major issues, uh, like overarching issues is just functioning under capitalism in the sense that like, okay, if we're talking about sustainability, um, it, you know, it, it's about the capital that goes into uh, like get having access to all these technologies or like, um, the issue of uh, like all-nighters, like we uh, place value on people based on how productive they can be versus, um, you know, their own like intrinsic self-worth. Or uh, in that case, I, it almost feels like um, opening up this discussion uh, is, you know, maybe like cathartic at best. So, like. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think it's, yeah, it just comes down to like feeling like maybe you're not capable of really doing anything significant about it and that's why it doesn't like necessarily get addressed. So I guess like touching back up on uh, what Lori mentioned, yeah, we're like partly culpable in that sense because we feel that we're not really capable of making any change that we hold back from actually attempting to. <laughs>
So it sounds like most people are saying that these issues began educationally once you started studying architecture, like academically versus having noticed, like you, there was a drastic change versus believing that you didn't have agency or believe or not having an ego before you came to school? I mean, because this is a larger issue than architecture. Architecture is an institution that works within these systems, but like, is that what, is that what you're trying to say? No, not exactly. That it became amplified? Um, like, what became amplified specifically? Well, you're, I'm hearing that like, when you started studying architecture, that these questions were arising, but was the fact that you were studying architecture amplifying these issues? Or was it something, these, um, these pressures or these, um, that these issues were happening beforehand? So how specifically is like architecture or your education of architecture changing these things? You couldn't work in groups before I'll yeah, say something how to that. that you know, um, that I think the immediate response to what um, he said is that I always answer to people that complain that they don't have enough classes outside of um, Slocum mm -hmm. is that, uh, and this is not the right answer, is that this is a professional program. Um, it is a B-ARC and that stems from, I, I think it goes back to um, that as architects we kind of tend to just do what's required. So what's required is the curriculum and then that becomes a problem that it's a systemic problem where and CARB comes in or NAB comes in here and says you need more construction classes so where do you fit those in? Do you take out like the women's studies classes that would have been in there or you know the sociology classes that would have been in there or you know one of Lori's public space classes that would have been in there you know that were being pushed in and then you have the people at the top telling you, no, you need more architecture. I, yeah, I, I think there's two different sides of this, right? I, I, I think from, from one point of view, I, um, and I've said this to many of my students throughout the years, that um, there is no single architectural project that has ever been conceived of and constructed all the way through by one person. There's always collaboration. There's always multiple people involved in one lever, level or another. Uh, in, in the rare cases, you're working at least with um, a contractor or engineers or someone else to, to, to make this thing happen. Or at actually collaborating with clients. That's another kind of collaboration that's, that's uh, essential to the architectural problem. Um, the other side of the issue is that um, uh, a colleague of mine a few years ago said this, and I couldn't agree with him more, that uh, architecture as a profession is something that actually takes much, much longer to learn than you can do in five years. Um, to, to learn, how, to, to properly learn what it means to, to practice architecture, you need maybe eight years. Uh, the problem is that the types of jobs or the type of income that you can get at the other side of that would not support the, the amount of schooling you'd have to go through to, to do that. Um, you know, this is why, you know, uh, to get a, a law degree, you, you have to do a four-year undergrad and then you do like three or four years in grad school to, to get that or, or medicine. So that's kind of like eight years as a professional program. You ha that's the entire profession. Um, but at the other end of that, they have they have access to income that is going to offset all of the, the, the schooling. We, we don't have that. So we're always, especially from the, from the curricular end, we're always faced with this problem of we need to give them more time to do the things that they need to learn before we send them out there. But there's all these other pressures and we don't have enough time to do it. And you know, we're even looking at reducing the curriculum even more. Like, uh, it's 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 a tough sell, you know. I mean, I want to go back to what you had mentioned about the ego and your autonomy, and I think, you know, there's a there's many things we try to teach you as you move through the curriculum, and one is clearly establishing your own voice as a designer and what that means, but I think also acknowledging that you are exposed to many different types of knowledge that are required to become an architect or to practice architecture. 
And that is interdisciplinary. We call it building technology, we call it history, we call it theory, we call it media or representation. And those are, although with un, under the rhetoric of architecture, there are interdisciplinary differences. And then you also have requirements in the humanities and arts and sciences. So by default, the curriculum is an interdisciplinary curriculum. So we may not think, you may not think of it in the terms that maybe interdisciplinarity sparks immediately, but the knowledge of an architect is one that has to be able to bridge many different types of knowledge bases and work with different types of people. So, but I think the issue of authorship is really critical and you have to learn how to collaborate. I don't, some people come by it more naturally than others, but it's a critical aspect of our discipline is that you have to work with other people in order to make what you wanna happen, happen. If that's building, if that's installation, if that's drawing, what have you. So I think it's, 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 part, it's in some ways a curse, in some ways a blessing. And I think you have to figure out how you let go of your ego in some ways and how you expand it and adapt and work with others as well. So it only does a disservice to your education if you're not willing to at least let test those boundaries and let go and share knowledge production and knowledge learning. Okay, I think we're gonna end it on that. Um, thanks everyone for coming and thank you for all our panel, to all our panel members for being here tonight. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.